and welcome to episode two of Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm Andy, one of your hosts for the show, and I'm here with my friends and co-hosts, Patrick and Vince. Hello, and Vince is new. He wasn't here last time. Well, he's not new. Nice yeah. of you to include me this time. <laughs> I think he was out working. He something. was. He was. That happens occasionally. <laughs> It's All right. nice to be part of the broadcast. Well, we're so happy thanks, to ha- yes, we're happy to have you here. Um, the more the merrier. So let's talk about uh, episode two. We have a jam-packed episode for sure. Uh, I know that I've got a, a piece coming up on the, our Deep Creek Bridge project replacement with the city of Chesapeake and our project manager. And I know, Andy, you've got some. I uh, covered the people of the district for this episode. So first, I have a previously recorded feature piece I did on Shannon Reinheimer, who, um, just to give you a little teaser, actually has strapped herself to a whale. So <laughs> if that and sounds interesting to you. How in the world do you strap yourself so you to a whale? you have to listen to find oh. out. And survive. How would you survive <laughs> something like that? And uh, the other part of the people piece uh, in this episode is we're going to do another edition of our Great Places to Work. And what's interesting this time is we brought in one of our experts to answer some of the questions that we got in from our Facebook page. And Vince, what do you have cooking? We're going to uh, go around the district and update you on what's happening with our folks and uh, news that's out there this month. Awesome. And as, as always, remember to go down to our show notes after this episode for all of the related links. All right, let's kick this off. Patrick, start off our second episode. So our first segment for this episode is on Deep Creek Bridge. For those of you who are not listening in the area of Hampton Roads, this bridge is a two-lane drawbridge that is in the city of Chesapeake. Uh, It's been functionally obsolete or identified as functionally obsolete since about 1996, 1998 time frame. And it's a bridge that the district has been working to replace. So we brought in uh, Earl Sorry with the city of Chesapeake and Walt Trincala, our uh, project manager, to talk about the bridge and where we are in the process. So I want to welcome Earl Sorry with the City of Chesapeake and Walt Trincala with the Corps of Engineers to Core Talk. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here, Patrick. So I want to kind of talk about um, the Deep Creek Bridge project. I know a couple of weeks ago we had a uh, public information meeting here in the City of Chesapeake, and I want to get your sense of how that went. But to start off with, um, you know, just talk to me about the bridge and its current status in terms of traffic over the bridge as, as you know, what the problems it creates. Well, Patrick, the bridge was built back uh, originally in 1934. It's an 86-year-old bridge. It's considered functionally obsolete, meaning that it's still safe, but uh, functionally obsolete in that it no longer can handle the volume of traffic. And the uh, it's a very narrow bridge, and it also has weight restrictions to it. And it's also poor alignment with the, uh, with the current uh, road conditions. Yeah, so, you know, currently the Deep Creek Bridge is probably one of the biggest choke points in the city of Chesapeake. And, you know, it's a bridge that was designed to carry probably 8,000 vehicles a day uh, early in its life. Uh, Today it carries over 26,000 vehicles uh, a day. So, you know, from from a functionality standpoint, it's certainly considered functionally obsolete. Uh, And, of course, that 26,000 vehicles per day can grow anytime there's an incident on Interstate 64, and then this becomes the the relief valve and and associated route for that uh, diverted traffic. So given all the items that you you have out there with the poor alignment, the the bridge is, uh, you know, handling more traffic than it was ever designed for, why, I guess it kind of explains for us why it needs to be replaced. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a two-lane uh, drawbridge right now that's going to be replaced with, uh, with a five-lane uh, uh, double-leaf uh, drawbridge. Um, the uh, construction of this uh, bridge will be done in phases, and um, we will construct the, the eastbound two-lane bridge to the, to the existing current bridge. And uh, once that uh, two-lane eastbound bridge is constructed, We'll divert the traffic from that existing bridge onto the eastbound, and then we'll uh, demolish the existing bridge, and uh, we will uh, work on and construct the, uh, the three-lane westbound bridge. So uh, basically, uh, the uh, motorists will have uh, access to a five-lane bridge at the completion of, um, of the project. And this will better align the, the, the bridge with the actual lanes that are coming up, up to it right now. 
there's been a lot of local work done to tie into uh, the, the, the core owned bridge. So, you know, construction of the four lane Moses Grandy Trail and improvements of the Mill Creek Parkway intersection, replacement of the uh, fixed span long bridge up near the fire station on George Washington Highway, and then most recently the widening of George Washington Highway up to the interstate. And of course, all of those things were done you know, to kind of position us for uh, success whenever this bridge is replaced. So, so now the bridge really is that last link in that network. So, you know, much like the citizens, we're anxiously awaiting uh, that project moving forward. I guess for the folks out there that are that are listening, and, and especially in the, the Deep Creek uh, area who utilize this bridge, I guess the next question is, where are we in this process of, of, of getting this bridge built? Well, currently, Patrick, the, the design is, is completed. It's 100% uh, uh, completed. Um, but currently, we have the project being scheduled to be advertised in September 2020 and awarded in the early 2021. But as Colonel Kinsman mentioned to the citizens at the public information in, uh, meeting on the 30th of January, that there's three action items that we need and that we're following uh, to award this uh, construction contract. And one is the um, real estate acquisition and easements. Uh, so all the real estate has to be acquired and I have to re receive a land certification. Uh, another thing that we're working on is the utility relocation. All the utility lines have to be relocated and cleared out of the way for the contractor to move forward uh, with uh, constructing the project. The third thing that we need is, is additional funding. The uh, project cost has uh, increased, and that, that was due bas basically to the you know, cost escalation, to real estate delays, to increase in construction material and, and labor. So um, in addition, to that 3.5 will help us administer the, the const construction tr uh, contract for the first year. But in total, we would need uh, $9.2 million uh, that would get us through the duration of the, uh, of the project. Now, as I mentioned, we had that citizens' information meeting a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the concerns you heard at that meeting, and would you be willing to address those concerns now? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the biggest thing we we heard is, you know, okay, we understand there's a plan in place. When's it gonna When's it gonna be here? We, you know, when will we see construction? When will we, will we be driving on it? And you know, that's that's the big question. And of course, you know, through our partnership with the Corps, you know, we're we're working to uh, to, to get us to that point. But uh, that that is everybody's big question right now. The other uh, major question we heard was is the bridge going to potentially close during construction? And so, you know, we've explained the sequencing that uh, the bridge will remain open for the duration of the construction and that a, a one uh, bridge will be built on, on a southern alignment and then traffic will be diverted, then the existing bridge will be demolished and a bridge built back in that place. So I think uh, the citizens that heard that were very relieved to hear that there wasn't going to be a, a long-term closure that they were going to have to live with. Hearing at the uh, information meeting, public information meeting, I, I feel the frustration. I read it on the, the um, Facebook pages. Uh, I hear it locally because I'm, I'm a resident of the um, uh, city of Chesapeake. And, uh, you know, and I hear it. I hear the frustration. And uh, so we, my team really wants this bridge to be completed. And we understand that it's, it's, it's a project that's it's, it's in need for sure. Um, it's going to help uh, improve the safety, the flow of traffic, and also with the with the hurricane evacuation. So, our team is working hard. We really want to have this project completed, and we will have it completed. We just have to. It's a it's a long process that that uh, we have to go through to make sure that people are um, treated fairly, and we are following the right processes. And I think the citizens are also going to be relieved in the fact that there's just going to be a new bridge in place and some of that traffic, maybe not all the traffic headaches, is going to be relieved. I mean, you still have to get them queued out, but a lot of what they're feeling now is going to not be experienced once the new bridge is in place. Yeah, so would it be like other major intersections in the city? During peak hours, you know, particularly for your left turns, there's still going to be some delay, but it won't be that notorious bottleneck that is experienced on a daily basis right now. So one of the things I know that we've heard at the Corps of Engineers is that, uh, you know, is there going to be a toll on the bridge? And what stops the city from putting a toll on after we transfer ownership of the bridge to, to you all? So there will be no toll, and uh, that 
is actually included in the agreement between the Army Corps of Engineers and the city of Chesapeake that uh, uh, upon the city uh, taking over the bridge at completion that we would be prohibited from ever placing a toll uh, along that uh, bridge. And that model's kind of already been in place for those who are in the, in the area who understand what uh, the Great Bridge Bridge, um, that was a Corps-owned bridge, Corps built the bridge and then transferred to the city and there's still no toll on yeah, and so you know, again, that's that's just you know building on a on a successful partnership. So yeah, we we anticipate that uh, this handoff would be very similar to what was uh, successfully done with the Great Bridge Bridge. And how excited is the city going to be once it's finally completed? You know, this is certainly you know one of our city council's top transportation priority, if not the top transportation priority in the city of Chesapeake right now. So you know, we are anxiously awaiting. Uh, to, to, to start construction and then ultimately to get some congestion and safety relief. So ultimately, we're going to get the bridge built. Yes, I mean, we're, we're going to turn some dirt, and that's, that's our mission. Well, I want to once again thank you, Walt, and thank you, Earl, for, for participating in Core Talk. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I want to thank Earl Sorry and Walt Trincala once again for coming on the program and talking about the Deep Creek Bridge. Uh, there is some websites that are available. Uh, we have a website. The city has a website. Those items are going to be in the show notes. So definitely refer to that for all that information. Okay, so we had Patrick talk about our projects. Now I'm going to talk about our people. So um, when I first got to the district about a year ago, um, I, I really wanted to walk around and talk and find out people's stories. And I met one of our marine biologists, uh, Shannon Reinheimer, who the more I got a chance to talk with her um, during different projects, the more, more I realized she is completely fascinating. So I'd like to play for you um, one of the uh, segments that we recorded a while back, but it's still just as cool. Take a listen. <laughs> During our interview, I realized that this environmental scientist, like many U.S. Army Corps of Engineers employees here, didn't fit into my preconceived idea about government personnel. But if you give me the otolith, which is a little bone in the ear, I can identify the fish by the bone in the ear, but not the, the actual whole fish. <laughs> I asked her if I could call her a tree hugger, and she responded by wrinkling her nose as if suddenly smelling something foul and I realized it was decidedly not cool for me to call her that. But she's an empathetic person and observed my apologetic look. There was woods behind the house and they had decided that they wanted to clear the, the trees. And so they had marked the ones they wanted to clear with ribbons and I didn't want them to tear them down. So, so I went and I ripped down all the ribbons so they couldn't tell which tree was the, <laughs> was the ones they were gonna cut down. They gave up actually, they're like, well, she feels that strongly about it. We probably shouldn't cut down the trees. As we spoke, her waxing intensity about things like microplastics and blue crabs were followed by waning apologies, typifying the self-described introvert. Her fervor for ecology was evident, and her excitement made me want to know more. I asked her about her childhood. I was born in Wyoming. Um, I lived there for the first few years of my life, and uh, my parents got divorced and so we moved back home where my mom's family was which was Virginia Beach and I've been there pretty much since I was about four or five so I'm almost a native. <laughs> she noted that her youth was shaped by being exposed to nature it was just where she felt comfortable. Um, I, I, I guess even as a child growing up I was very introverted I, I didn't like large crowds or, or, or busy places, but I liked being outside. I liked being where things were quiet, but you could hear the sound, like the natural sounds like birds and the trees and the wind. And um, it was just, I, I just found peace there. She studied the pre-veterinary field while attending Old Dominion University in Norfolk. Her reserved character and aversion to the public aspect of a veterinary practice eventually steered her to change her majors to biology. There, she could concentrate fully on what she really loved, reptiles, herpetology, and conservation. Now, although dying from a venomous snake bite in the U.S. almost never happens, I find the possibility of it absolutely terrifying. 
For our scientists here, regularly handling deadly snakes wasn't a white knuckle event. So she found her rush by volunteering with the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center's Stranding Response Project program. So as part of the team, she rescued and rehabilitated marine life. Uh, while I was in school, I, I, was a, I was a Sunday volunteer. So you pretty much committed to one, one day a week, a shift one day a week, and you would volunteer um, about 95% of what you did as a volunteer was interact with dead animals, meaning if dead sea turtles or marine mammals like whales, dolphins, seals washed up on the beach, um, you'd respond, you'd recover the carcass, and then you would assist with necropsy and sampling. We spent 20 minutes Eating, delving into the detection about, of environmental um, changes based upon a sea turtle's belly contents, and I have to tell you, so it's completely fascinating. Really you, can, you can learn about the availability of food in, in the location that they were feeding. You can learn about, um, you can learn about their diet structure over the years. She essentially became the go-to person for sea turtle guts. She graduated but found difficulty landing a job in her field. And while a full-time position evaded her, she did secure part-time slots with both the Virginia Zoo and her alma mater's herpetology lab. As a zoo employee and animal ambassador, she educated children about wildlife. While at the lab, she was immersed in studying and research. Then, in 2008, she returned to the Virginia Aquarium as a full-time employee. So I'd get up at 3 or 4 a.m. and I'd go out with the pound net fishermen, and we were actually measuring the net. Um, so there's, there's the leader line that's on a pound net. It's kind of hard to explain unless you're looking at it. it. It used to have a really big problem catching turtles, dolphins, whatever. And so we were actually testing an alternative leader line to see if it was. The team lost their veterinary technician, and those duties need to be reassigned. Reinheimer had a veterinary-based education, and her experience poised her as the perfect candidate. I learned all kinds of things like how to give injections, how to draw blood, how to do wound repair, debridement of like, of, of like wound care. Um, uh, we, we learned how to basically connect turtle shells back together if they were hit. Um, we learned how to clean out nasty infections, like all kinds of weird stuff that you wouldn't really think of. This is also the time when she gained and employed the single coolest certification that I never knew existed. A whale disentangler. Yes, that's a thing. You attach yourself to a really large animal, cut very carefully, try not to fall off, <laughs> or, <laughs> or go for a really long ride with the whale. Because what they're, you can actually, they'll, they're pretty strong. They can pull the boat very easily. And it's not, it doesn't go... It doesn't go slow. When Although thrilling, those extra tasks led to a nearly unsustainable work-life balance. According to Reinheimer, there actually wasn't a balance at all, and the 90-hour work week took a social and emotional toll. Additionally, her health really began to suffer. There's, when you're dealing with uh, any animal, a uh, marine mammal, marine, or marine animal, or, or land animal, you, you basically are, you, you can get exposed to zoonotic diseases. So those are basically diseases that can be transferred from animal to human. And I had a lot of really weird exposures over the years um, that, that kind of drove me to my edge of, like, uh, I'm kind of tired of getting my blood monitored by the Department of Health, and uh, this isn't that much fun. Um, I also had a lot of injuries. I had several bites. Um, I have a, a bite in my left thigh from a, about a 200-pound loggerhead. Um, <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> so in 2016, there was a series of fortunate events for Reinheimer. It began with knowing somebody who knew somebody who knew something about the Norfolk District. Um, and so I was looking for another job, and I was helping a friend of mine uh, with his business over Christmas because he had a lot of Christmas orders. And we were sitting there, and he's like, so have you, you know, what kind of jobs are you looking for? I'm like, well, I'm still looking for, you know, a, a, a biologist or a scientist. And um, his brother-in-law walks in the door, and he says, hey, you know, is, is Army Corps hiring a biologist? You guys looking for a marine biologist? <laughs> and he goes, let me check. Actually, we are. 
and so he he uh, directed me to the USA Jobs and um, told me a little bit about the position and uh, I had an interview in January and then I had the job in March so <laughs> Now, Ryan Heimer is a staple on the district team as a scientist and volunteer in outreach programs, as well as those in science, technology, engineering, and math, commonly known as STEM. She uses her collective capabilities as a student, educator, and scientist to instruct the next wave of conservationists. Her philosophy, one person leading by example, is more effective than a hundred people telling others what they should do. With that in mind, Ryan Heimer has proven essential as a building block of the Norfolk District team. My mind is still blown by what some of the stuff that she has done. But the other thing that she does around here is we have a local school, Norfolk Christian, uh, who comes out to do our oysters. We actually have uh, oyster reefs. Um, here right around the Waterfield building in, in downtown Norfolk, and uh, we grow baby oysters. And the, the school students come, and they do measurements, and they do water quality sampling, and it's all part of our STEM outreach that we have. And Shannon actually helps lead that. And so it, it, you see her out in the winter months, out of once, once out of a month out there with the students, and they're going through all the oysters and stuff. So she still is pr very active and, and really loves what she does, and it's it's just fascinating. It's truly a remarkable tale. I cannot believe that something like that's even possible, some of the things that she's done. Uh, as Patrick said, it just blows my mind as well. And uh, and again, definitely uh, reach out to us because we'd love to hear your thoughts about, about the piece. Okay, I guess it's time for some district news. Take it away, Vince. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, just want to check. Uh, here's what's happening around Norfolk District. The Army Corps of Engineers continues to play a role in space exploration, at least when it comes to protecting launch facilities. Norfolk District has awarded a $23.7 million contract to Continental Heavy Civil Corporation, a Miami-based firm, for beach renourishment at NASA's Wallops Island flight facility. It includes breakwater construction and placing 1.3 million cubic yards of sand along a four-mile stretch of the waterfront, designed to reduce risk and alleviate impacts of coastal storms at the facility. Dave Pierce, the Wallace Flight Facility Director said this beach replenishment project is critical to protecting 1.2 billion in infrastructure on the island, which supports the nation's ability to explore space. Work along the beach is expected to begin this spring and take about a year to complete. Following a huge restoration effort last year along the Virginia Beach oceanfront, Norfolk District and its contractor, Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company out of Oak Brook, Illinois, are turning their attention to nearby Sandbridge. The next phase in the Sandbridge Beach Coastal Storm Damage Reduction Project is cranking up this month. Equipment mobilization for the 2020 beach renourishment cycle is slated to continue through early March at Little Island Park. Sand borrow and placement procedures will start after mobilization. They're planned for completion in May. Engineers say it's a critical storm damage reduction project that lessens risk to this section of Virginia Beach. The coastline and adjacent development are vulnerable to direct wave attacks during storms and hurricanes. The 725-foot-wide, five-mile project area stretches from the Dam Neck Fleet Training Center to the Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge. The last storm damage project was completed here in 2013. The current $20.3 million contract, funded entirely by the City of Virginia Beach, includes placement of about 1.7 million cubic yards of sand. Despite ongoing challenges, plans to replace the aging Deep Creek Bridge in Chesapeake are moving forward. On January 30th, about 150 community members turned out for a public meeting at Deep Creek Middle School. They heard project updates and got a peek at bridge designs from Army Corps of Engineers and city personnel. Colonel Patrick Kensman, the district commander, led a formal presentation that highlighted ongoing real estate hurdles and how that process works, as well as utility relocations and funding. A $57.9 million project has been fully designed. It will replace the old two-lane bridge, which was built in 1934, with a structurally sound 144-foot long, 60-foot wide, five-lane dual-leaf drawbridge. Engineers are targeting early next year to start construction, and completion is expected in 2024. Plans are contingent on getting all the real estate property interests resolved this year. In other news, Norfolk District and its partner, the City of Virginia Beach, along with several key stakeholders, have secured Virginia Marine Resources Commission approval for the Lynn Haven River Ecosystem Restoration Project's reef habitat. At a hearing January 28th, the panel voted 7-2 to two in favor of a permit aimed at establishing sanctuary status for USACE restoration reefs. The district is finalizing a memorandum of understanding with VMRC to protect reefs under this project. District leaders say a contract award is on track and scheduled for mid-May. 
And finally, work crews from U.S. Facilities Incorporated, the primary services contract on the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway for Norfolk District, have pulled the 15-ton canal gates out of the water at South Mills Lock in North Carolina. As a result, the Dismal Swamp Canal between Virginia and North Carolina remains temporarily closed to vessel traffic. And finally, work crews from U.S. Facilities Incorporated, the primary services contractor on the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway for Norfolk District, have pulled the 15-ton canal gates out of the water at South Mills Lock in North Carolina. As a result, the Dismal Swamp Canal between Virginia and North Carolina remains temporarily closed to vessel traffic. The gates are getting sandblasted and scrubbed during a $525,000 rehabilitation project. Canal gates on the AIWW are removed and restored every 15 to 20 years as part of a services plan that increases a lock's lifespan. Engineers typically target slower months for major refurbishment projects. Repairs at South Mills Lock should be completed by the end of March, just before the spring migration of vessels traveling north for the summer. It's among Norfolk District's ongoing commitment to ensure safe navigation on these channels and waterways across Virginia. And that's what's happening around Norfolk District. Back to you, Andy. With that, I'd like to welcome Tom to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So, Tom, before we start answering uh, some of the questions that came in to us from Facebook, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I actually came to Norfolk District in 2009 as an active duty Army captain and worked here for a couple of years before I decided to transition out of the Army. Uh, shortly after, I started working as a DA civilian with Norfolk District uh, in the field as a construction project engineer. Uh, over the years, kind of grown up through the ranks to my current position, where I'm the deputy chief for our engineering construction division. And one of my major responsibilities is uh, hiring manager. Okay, so you're more than just a federal careers segment expert then. Sure, sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to need you to call upon that federal careers expertise to answer some of these questions. Are you ready? Sure. Yeah, I feel go. like I'm, I'm almost trying to trick you. I'm not. <laughs> we, have the, we have the questions and answers actually in front of us. Um, so there's the magic behind the podcast. All right, so... Um, one of the, the first question that came in uh, from our Facebook page was, when it comes to submitting college transcripts, how do I format it if the job posting does not require official transcripts? Okay, so I, I would first direct applicants to, to review the specific instructions for that announcement, and they should adhere to those as closely as possible. However, applicants are always able to submit other supporting documents in addition to those that are already required so they can further demonstrate their experience qualifications for a particular announcement. So examples of supporting documents could be transcripts, certificates, licenses, wards, and in general, um, Adobe PDF is the best format. Um, so can someone submit too many documents? Like is there, there's no cutoff? I don't believe so, um, but you, you should probably keep it to the most pertinent documents that are going to really demonstrate what your experience and qualifications are. It's almost kind of like if you're applying in person to any other civilian job, you want to be to the point and succinct. Sure. Um, question two, um, a question about federal resumes. It's often recommended to condense resumes down to two pages. I have a seven plus page federal resume. Is that a negative to have a big resume? So in most cases, there's no minimum or maximum number of pages for a resume submitted for federal jobs. However, again, applicants need to follow the specific instructions of that particular announcement in case there are limitations. What we encourage is applicants to, to clearly describe their knowledge, skills, and abilities is appropriate for the job that they're applying for. And the best resource to use is the USA Jobs Resume Builder, which will ensure that you include all the requisite information that the announcement's looking for. Nice, okay. All right, this is question number three. Some job postings are open for a year. Does it matter when I submit my application? Is it better to submit early? <laughs> so this is, uh, this is what we typically refer to as an open and continuous uh, type of announcement. And depending on the agency and the announcement, typically they will pull a list of qualified applicants on a periodic basis. Uh, that, will change. that will change depending on you know, the agency and the specific announcement. But in general, um, they tend to lose visibility and interest the longer they're open. So it might be beneficial to apply earlier, but again, it's dependent. Gotcha. Yep. Um, all right, you passed the test this time. Awesome. Um, <laughs> good job. Any last recommendations? Let's talk about like some, especially, you know, we have these college kids looking to get their foot in the door. What would you say to those folks uh, in specific? So my recommendation would be for candidates to reach out to the agencies that they're particularly interested in working with. 
we're fortunate right now that we have a lot of direct hire authorities uh, that allow us to work one-on-one -on -one with candidates and bring them in uh, to fill potential vacancies. We don't necessarily have to use USA Jobs. So yeah, uh, for our listeners, as far as we were talking about USA Jobs, direct hire, um, even you know we didn't talk about this time, but the Pathways program, we went over that in episode one. Um, so uh, go down to your show notes and check back with episode one to get some of the um, the explanation of what those those actually mean. With that, I'd like to thank Mr. Tom Booth and remind our listeners that if you have any questions you'd like us to address during our Great Places to Work segment. Look for our contact information in the show notes. All right, Tom, hopefully uh, we'll have you back again. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Um, I guess, is this it? I'm sorry, Patrick, this is it. We're done? We have to end. No, we don't. <laughs> we can keep going. Vince is like, I'm good. We can end. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll be back, we promise, next month. <laughs> We want to thank all those who helped us make this possible this month, and we look forward to working with even more people next month. Until then, this is Core Talk. Core Talk is the official podcast of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Core Talk constitutes permission to use that content as part of the broadcast. Core Talk is recorded at the Norfolk District Headquarters building in Norfolk, Virginia, and is produced by the district's public affairs staff.